Hey guys, Frank Forte here, creator of Warlash, Asylum of Horrors, Undead Evil, Billy Boy, Vampire Versus, and a bunch of other indie comics from the 90s, 2000s, and beyond. I've also worked on Bob's Burgers, the comic book and TV show, Solar Opposites, Lovecraft Country, Conjuring the Devil Made Me Do It. Go back and forth between storyboards and comics. And I'm here today on Two Geeks Talking to talk comics. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso, because it says so on my lower third. We are joined today by a very talented artist and creator and storyboard artist. You have seen his work from Bob's Burgers. You know his work from Asylum Press. We are joined today by the ever-talented Frank Forte. How are you doing today, Frank? Hey, Kurt. How are you? I'm doing good. Awesome. Looking at your work from on Asylum Press, uh, I, I've seen it on Twitter as well, too. You have an amazing style and talent, and I want to jump it right into it here because I know you have a limited amount of time. How did you get started as an artist? Um, you know, I think I was always drawing when I was a kid. Uh, so it was always something I was into. And, um, you know, went to college for art and graphic design. And then after college, you know, kept taking courses in New York, like the Art Students League and the School of Visual Arts, and just kind of stuck with comics. I always really wanted to do uh, comics. And I did a lot of, like, indie comics in the 90s, like... Uh, you know, these right here, Vampire Versus was one uh, that I did with CFD. I worked for Boneyard. Then I started my own company, Asylum Press, where I did Warlash, Asylum of Horrors. I worked with Robert Ryan from Girls and Corpses. I did comics all through the 90s. And then, you know, it was just difficult for me to, um, you know, make a living because I could never really break into the mainstream. My style was always kind of very indie, very black and white. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I knew a lot of people were uh, making a living being storyboard artists out in L.A., working in either animation, film, or commercials. So I knew some people that moved out, and because I could, I could draw and I knew how to tell stories, um, I just kind of learned the film language, the storyboard language, and moved out there and started getting work. And, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty lucrative, and it was, it was a little hit or miss at the beginning, I have to say, 2002, 2003. But then when it picked up, you know, I had, I've had pretty much steady work, you know, since. So I've always dabbled in comics. I've worked as an editor and contributor to Heavy Metal, you know, all throughout the 2000s. And I published a comic book here and there. I put my stuff out on Webtoon. But COVID, when work dried up, kind of allowed me to get back into comics. And that's what I've been doing for the past year. So now I'm ready to kind of put them out and I'm using uh, Kickstarter to do it. But basically that's the <laughs> that's the, the career trajectory in a nutshell. To, to be in the comic and, and animation and film industry itself, I mean, I graduated from uh, communication media and film at the University of Windsor myself. So as, oh, cool. a, as a producer mainly. So the necessity of storyboards was often underutilized by students, unfortunately, but I'm glad as a fellow artist, you, you understand that concept. Yeah, right. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people don't know how to use them or don't use them, but it's really uh, key, especially if there's, you know, a lot of special effect shots or, I mean, just as a just as a, a tool for the director to talk to the crew on the set and be like, these are the shots we need. This is a basic, you know, sometimes the director wants exactly the shot. Other times he just wants to use it as a, you know, like a template, like here's the shots that I want, but let's work with the DP. Let's work with the actors. Let's maybe talk about it, but let's use this as a jumping off point. You know, it could be used all sorts of different ways. Commercials really utilize them because the agency really wants to know exactly what they're going to shoot. The agency really wants to nail it down because of budget. But it's also a time thing when you get on set and everyone's there and then all of a sudden the director gets there and is like, oh, hmm, you know, well, where should we shoot from? What's the blocking? What are we doing? You know, then you're starting, you know, it's like every, that's why everybody's waiting around. If you go there with a storyboard and you already know what the set was and you have some of the blocking in mind, 
it just goes smoother. I mean, ask anyone that's on a set. If you go to a set where there's a storyboard and it's laid out and you've discussed it beforehand, the day just goes much quicker, much smoother. Totally agree. And you're not wasting people's time, which is always right. a good thing. So let's jump into, of course, Warlash itself. You know, this is your, you're doing a Kickstarter for this particular comic. Tell us what Warlash is about, because it, just in looking at what I've seen on the Webtoons and, and on the Asylum Press website, uh, it looks like a, a fantastic story, like just right up my alley for action and for characters. Yeah, right. So Warlash is a r renegade rogue agent of the government who is like a secret bioweapon, I guess a biomechanical half cyborg weapon who uh, went rogue in a like post-apocalyptic future, not not like post nuke, but more like a dystopian future. Um, and, you know, I was inspired by 2000 AD heavy metal epic, um, you know, Robocop, Judge Dredd and all that stuff. So this is kind of like my own, you know, inspired by these characters, I created, uh, you know, Warlash and of course, you know, Daredevil, Batman, you know, all that stuff. It's kind of a combination. So he's an armored warrior who is just battling mutants and villains and creatures and cyborgs and just this, he's got this, you know, rogues gallery of villains that are trying to either destroy him take over the world, destroy the world, turn people into mutants. And he's constantly fighting these, you know, crazy villains. So if you like hardcore action, a lot of, you know, gunplay, sword play, gore heads being chopped off. Like, I don't really, I don't really like to pull punches because I don't really, I'm not working with the comics code or anything. I'm just like, I'm just like doing what I like and what I like to see. And a lot of that is, you know, I like, I used to love reading what Simon Bisley was doing in the 90s in heavy metal and just heads being lopped off and just body parts and just crazy action scenes or like the way Frank Miller would, you know, cut down the action scenes. Like, I love all that stuff. So I just try to combine all that into this crazy, hardcore, hard hitting, just action packed chaos and carnage you know so that's basically what warlash is i guess a kickstarter itself is always a difficult beast to wrangle when it comes to it's a cross between self-promotion and a second job basically <laughs> oh it is it's a lot of work and this is my second one this year i did my first one which was vampire versus i didn't really raise that much a little over 2000 i think uh, but i've been out of it for a while and i don't think people know me for comics i think when you're in comics and you're on webtoon and you're out there you know, you have a bigger following. Uh, we don't really have a huge following. So it's kind of like starting almost from scratch, like being like, hey guys, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. So yeah, you're constantly promoting yourself. You're trying to do it. I mean, Warlash is only trying to raise $3,000. So I think we're at 2,300 right now. Yeah. So it's not that much. But when you look at other guys like, like Brian Polito, I mean, he raises over a quarter of a million every few months i mean it's just crazy his fan base is so dedicated and they're always right there to support him no matter what he does and yeah you think oh i'll do it i'll, I'll at least raise 20 or thirty thousand, no problem i mean i struggle to raise my basic goals but what i'm trying to do this year is do a small goal a small campaign deliver you know do the campaign deliver quickly and launch another one so I could just build my following. So that's really what I'm trying to do is just to deliver a bunch of small campaigns. And I'm going to try to do five or six this year if I can, nice. and just to build it up because you got to start building it up from somewhere. But you've done so much in your career itself. I'm sure you have a following from heavy metal to everything else. It's just about reminding them that, hey, I also do this type deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, I mean, my following on Instagram is maybe, I think it's, is it over 7,000? Okay, Twitter cool. is, all my Twitters are only not over, just over 1,000 each. And uh, LinkedIn, I don't really think does much. And then um facebook i got my five thousand friends but who knows who sees those posts yeah. so not really that big i mean you, you think i don't know some people seem like they just post start posting on instagram and they have like you know thirty thousand followers you know i try to i post a few times a day and i've been doing it for years but you know it's just my content or whatever it is my style i don't have a huge following so then when i go to do a kickstarter you don't seem to get like 
this massive fan base. So, so it's definitely a struggle trying to bring these people in and everybody's like distracted. I mean, look how many comic book Kickstarters there are in video games and content. And you're like, Hey, I'm over here. I'm doing a little indie comic Kickstarter. You, you can pledge 10 bucks and you know, you just get lost. So I'm just trying to, you know, get out there, you know, do more posting. I'm doing live draws on um, Twitch and YouTube every night during the Kickstarter. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to just get the word out, but I think it's a really cool book. I'm really excited about it. And I think like, if people just, you know, check it out or you can read Warlash for free on Webtoon. I'm also on Graphite and Tapas. So you could check it out there. And if you want to support, you know, 10 bucks, five bucks, you could, you could support the Kickstarter, but we've got tiers all the way up to like 180. If you want to get the everything package where you have like the limited cover, the sketch cover, the foil cover, and we have sketchbooks and, um, you know, Asylum Press back issues. There's a ton of add-ons once you get in there. So there's a lot of really cool stuff. If you're into like horror, indie comics, you know, dark science fiction. I mean, we're really kind of, Asylum Press is kind of like, you know, a little bit chaos comics, a little bit heavy metal, a little bit epic, and a little bit, you know, the black and white indie stuff mm -hmm. and not the, uh, the mainstream stuff I'm talking about like, you know, where Faust and Cry for Dawn and Razor and all those places were like, that's where we respond. That's where we came out of right. the black and white boom of the 90s. So we're still trying to kind of bring that back if we can. Like with everything else, when it comes to cycles every 20 years, um, I hope so. Too, sure. Too much awesomeness in the 90s that I that I definitely still recall. Very You're talking about comics? Yo, there there was so much cool stuff. I mean, when, when I started out, it was like 89, 90. Yeah. You had Cry for Dawn. You had Faust. You had James Obar's The Crow. You mm -hmm. had Jim Ballant doing stuff. And on top of that, you had tons and tons of indie black and white and guys doing horror. And, and you didn't even have to struggle to do 20, 30,000 copies because there were so many comic stores and so many people reading. And it was just, uh, you didn't even have to struggle. To, to get good orders you could make money just by putting out uh, just a regular book and now nowadays you struggle to get 2,000 orders mm -hmm. from diamond so i think you really need as an indie publisher you really need kickstarter to you know do a little something extra sell your original art or do like a exclusive kickstarter cover or you know sell your back issues you know you can you can really i think connect with fans on kickstarter and i think it's really important to be partly on Kickstarter, partly on Diamond, mm -hmm. and then doing your, your mail order thing from your website. Yeah. And I think you can you can do it and survive. The self-promotion itself is always difficult. I mean, like I said, before we started, I've been doing this for 12 years to get a consistent following is still difficult, even on the YouTube algorithm. So overall, it's uh, I understand the pain that, uh, that it is <laughs> when it comes to being an indie type creator yeah yeah i would say i would say it's not easy i i think what helps is once you get back into the comic stores and on the racks mm -hmm. i think that really that really helps like i'm on webtoon but webtoon is a lot of anime manga influence stuff and and i i for sure am not that although i do have a thing called um the in, the infinite kid which is something I wrote and I'm having a manga artist draw it. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of fit into what is popular on um, uh, Webtoon, but like Warlash and Undead Evil and all that stuff. That's not what you see on Webtoon. So I, I have a following and people read, but I do struggle, you know, getting like, you know, again, people get like a hundred thousand views and, you know, I'll get a few hundred, but as long as people are liking the stuff and reading it, I like to connect wherever I can. So that's so why I put it on Graphite and Tapas and, you know, you get small views, but if it brings people in that haven't seen you before, I think it's cool. Yeah, every every view helps. I mean, especially with today's um, short attention span when it comes to literally yeah. any type of mass media consumption. In fact, it's, it's kind of interesting. It feels like the last three interviews I've had um, they've all said the same thing. You know, I'm just an indie creator. I'm trying to get myself out there and my my brand out there like yourself with, of course, Warlash and, and Asylum Press as, a, as an independent publisher. Like, I'm trying to make my own noise and to not get washed away by the masses. So Yeah, no, totally. You know, more power to you to, to keep 
interviews like this and everything like that. I want to see everything that you do uh, become successful. Yeah, no, and I think we rely on, you know, podcasters and interview people to, you know, you guys are out there, you have a following, you're getting it out to a certain amount of people that haven't seen me yet. And, you know, every little podcast, every little live draw or interview helps. And, you know, Brian Polito is someone that, you know, when you talk to him, like, what's your success? And when he was in the 90s, he said he'd do a store signing where like one person would show up and he'd do a store signing where a hundred people would show up. And no matter who was there, he'd, he'd just give the pitch with the same amount of enthusiasm every time. Like, like there was, like there was a 500 people there, you know? And, and I think that's amazing. I think it's really good advice if you're doing store signings. I mean, you can't do it now with COVID, but it's really easy for me if I do a convention and I sit there all weekend and hardly anyone comes to the table and it's easy to get like, oh, what the hell am I doing? I just wasted a weekend, you know, this kind of sucks. But, you know, you just got to like be out there and just be, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm really excited about it. I'm into it. And just like forward, like, like forward 120%, you know, 200%, 300%. You got to just, you got to just give it. So I am kind of excited to get out there and do conventions. And, you know, before I worked on Bob's Burgers and Solar Opposites and stuff like that, I would definitely say that the crowds around my table were, you know, smaller. It was harder to get people to come. So having a good credit or a good Hollywood credit, and if you promote it like in the back with a banner, I mean, it does help bring uh, people to your table. And then you can say, oh, yeah, I worked on that. But also, here's my own stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it does help. So any creators that are doing um, working in Hollywood that also have their own stuff, you know, don't be afraid to utilize, you know, your the credits that you worked on. Hey, you worked on it. It's a popular show. People people want to connect with you because you worked on a show like there's not too many artists that worked on Bob's Burgers besides like me and Brad Rader, maybe a couple others that even do comic book conventions. So when people when we do them or Comic Con, we're the only ones there that are like, you know, oh, you worked on Bob's like, Oh, check it out. Can you sign my book? Can you give me a little sketch or whatever? So people love that stuff. It's a lot of, a lot of times, a lot of artists and creative people in general, because either they're introverted or maybe they just, they don't like the spotlight. Sometimes they don't usually promote themselves uh, with what they do. I think that's a lot of it too, is it's like, they're not into the self promotion or they're not doing something on the side. They don't have a comic book or a web thing or, or they're not into just tabling at a convention. Look, that's a whole, you know, doing the convention, getting a table, making your merch, you know, having a banner, promoting yourself, you know, going there and trying to sell eight hours a day for like two or three days. It's you got to be a certain person to do it. I mean, I've been doing it since I was like 19, you know, it's early 90s. I was sitting there in New York at the at the conventions in Boston, all on the East Coast and just selling my wares like I just was like this is what I have to do like I, I sent out a and I wasn't even that good but I sent out a bunch of letters to DC and Marvel and all that shit and I got rejected and early on I was like well screw this I'm just gonna do it myself like I don't what am I gonna do wait for someone to 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 accept me and publish me hell no I'm gonna I'm just gonna do my own comics get them printed at a printer I know how to talk to a printer because I was in graphic design and I figured out how to talk to distributors and, you know, I just figured out the whole process. So I was doing it early on and it just seemed like, why, why wait for these gatekeepers to allow me to, you know, I, I don't need your approval to put something out. I'm just going to do it, you know? So that's what I did. Kind of been doing it, doing it ever since, you know, it is difficult. I've seen it so many times where I've gone to like a fan expo and you, you can tell the difference between a bit of a, a newcomer to a convention right. versus a, a seasoned pro that's on the on the end alleyway type deal looking at uh, the masses and, and being active in, in, in their promotion. Um, I, you know, it's amazing to see talented artists like yourself when when I see them a new face at a convention that I haven't seen before. And it's like, oh, this is cool. This person's here finally. Or I'll look in the, the magazine and I'll say, oh, I'm going to hit this person, this person, this person up because I mean, this will probably be my last time I get to see them type situation. So yeah, I can't wait for yeah. comic conventions to finally come back. I know I'm, I'm excited too. I can't wait. I mean, and, and I, and look, when in the nineties I would go to, and I was, I was a little, 
Yeah, you're, you're unsure of yourself at first. And then you look at, I looked at what Cry for Dawn was doing in Boneyard Press and Brian Polito and Everett Hartsoe for Razor. And you see these guys just behind their table. They're just like, you know, s selling the books and pushing the books. And they're just like, like, uh, uh, not used car salesmen, but carnival barkers, you know, you're just like, check it out, you guys, you know, this is a great book, you know, you're gonna love it, you're gonna love it, we got this, we got this, we got this, and I'm like, I gotta be more like that, you know, that's how you sell books at a convention, like, you gotta bring people in, you gotta pitch your book, you gotta, you know, show them, and some people, look, if you're, I don't know, Mike Mignola or Todd McFarlane, you don't have to do that, you've proved yourself, you could just sit there and people will come to your table, mm -hmm. but before you're that, at that level, you got to you got to promote you got to push you know i'm always curious about this as an artist though and, and a creator yourself what is the most difficult part about being a creator i mean for me as a um self-publisher and self-promoter it's balancing the time between the business which is like scheduling budgets shipping books to distributors doing mail order stuff um contracts and working with creators trying to do that and then shut that down and go back into creative mode and draw and write a script um it's just something i've always done so i you learn how to turn it on and off but um you know for people that are just creators or can just write and draw all day and not have to worry about the publishing uh, sometimes you know I'm envious. I'm like, oh, I wish I could just I'd be creative all day, but I took this shit on. But at the same time, I'd rather have. I like having a little more control of the distribution and the promotion and how the stuff gets out there. You know, so I'm I'm I do like doing it, but it's also good to delegate. I think uh, once I build up a little bit, I'll be able to delegate jobs more and be able to uh you know deal with the creative a little bit more but i think that's that's the most difficult because if i could just be creative it's, it's, it's kind of hard like if you want to be creative it's good to like get on a roll where you're just doing it eight hours a day and you can really get on a roll but if you're like doing business four hours a day and creative four and bouncing back and forth i would say that's sometimes a difficult thing to balance uh being a child of the 90s, obviously, you must have uh, enjoyed the cartoons of, of that decade as well, too. Did you have a top three favorites or cartoons or comics? Yeah, I mean, I would say Ren and Stimpy were was my was my favorite. Um, what else did I like? I mean, I liked the Simpsons. I liked the early Simpsons from the Tracy Ullman show. I liked Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> um, I liked a lot of 90s anime yeah. like uh, Wicked City, yep. Demon City, Shinjuku, Erotsu Kadoji, Legend of the Overfiend, mm -hmm. like all that kind of intense, hyper violent, yeah. you know, anime was, it was just awesome. And you had to buy a bootleg. So you're always buying these like, you know, what generation <laughs> VHS is this? Is this third or fourth generation? <laughs> because I had a fourth generation, but you're saying this is second? I'm going to buy the second generation. Please, do you think you're going to have a DVD? And they're like, oh, we have a DVD, but it's um, it's subtitled, but it's better quality. You know what? I'll take the subtitled DVD, totally. <laughs> but even though it's it's subtitled, I want I want it. That's fine. That's fine. That's great. I'll take it. I'll take it. So we've got these like videotapes of Wicked City. Then I've got the bootleg subtitle DVD. <laughs> Then I got, you know, the real release DVD, you know, but yeah, all that stuff. And it just started on HBO. I'm like, oh, the Spawn animation from the 90s is here. Let me check that out. I just watched the pilot episode and I'm like, wow, this is like pretty good. I forgot all about this show, you know. And then you have, you have the, the classic, um, I'm thinking like Batman the Animated Series and... Uh, oh, Batman the Animated Series. That was great like too. Wolverine. Uh, the Powerpuff Girls. Yep. Yeah. Um, something oh. I checked out recently was the anime Wolverine and anime X-Men yep. that they just released. Yeah, those were kind of cool. Those I knew those existed, but they were never in English. Um, or are they in English or, or subtitle? Whatever they are, I never yeah. saw them. So yeah. those are kind of cool. Minimum. So this is um, War Last, Cold Metal Mayhem, and Bio Burden. It is running until June 19th, 2021. Um, this is... Uh, you know, this is a little about me. Um, it's two issues, Warlocks Cold Metal Mayhem and Bio Burden. 
Um, both are three ninety nine each. Oh, nice. um, this is the cover by Andy Hall. That's beautiful. And this is some interiors by Steve Mannion, uh, who you know, famous for Fearless Dawn. They just did a Fearless Dawn in Hellboy. Mm -hmm. This is a story that was in my Warlash Dark Noir, but we just colored it. Um, Omar Estevez colored it. That's beautiful. This is another interior by Dwayne Harris, who is a regular at Heavy Metal. Um, he wrote and drew this story. Um, the Bio Burden is covered by uh, Homeris Jelani. And, um, you know, some of the other rewards are Warlash Dark Noir 1, 2, and 3. We have two variant covers by David Fout, who's uh, popular, very popular on that convention nice. and uh, Kickstarter scene. Uh, Vicious Vixen's sketchbook is kind of like a sexy sketchbook of, you know, girl superheroes and vixens and stuff that um, I do in my spare time. Mm -hmm. There's a metal variant cover, which is only going to be available here and on our website oh, for a little bit after. You have uh, some more lash sketch covers in which I'll do a original pencil sketch with a little co color in it, and those are 50 each. $100 reward, you get both sketch covers. Uh, for 150 you get just about everything, and for 180 you get everything plus the Vicious Vixen sketchbook. There's another $40 reward, which is like the digital library of Asylum Press. Oh, you get nice. a bunch of horror stuff, some digital first stuff. And then um, Stretch Goals, we're having a foil trading card at 4000 another foil trading card at 5000 and some other prints at six and seven. I mean, we're far off from that, so I'm kind of bummed that we're not that high yet, but um, hopefully we'll get there. Then for add-ons, we have like a... $200 add-on. I'll do a original sketch cover on the sketch edition of Heavy Metal 300. Nice. Um, and then you can piecemeal the stuff. Like we have Warlash Dark Noir, some of Horrors number one and two, some of Horrors three, which was unavailable before. Um, early first printings of the Vampire Versus, Eek, which is a horror um, uh, anthology. Uh, Billy Boy 1, 2, and 3, which is another indie book that I did back in the 90s or two, early 2000s. Zombie Terrors, early Vampire Versus printing, some Fearless Dawn collections, uh, Chesticles, Deadly Are the Naked from Jim Smith, who's famous for Ren and Stimpy, some of his sketchbooks. If you're into animation, these are really cool. Very few remaining. Um, Hex of the Wicked Witch, um, sign set original printings and then very limited printings of the satan's powder room chicken soup for satan satan gone wild and satan's three ring circus of hell <laughs> who was created by robert s ryan the creator of uh, girls and corpses who's moved into horror film production oh, wow. and then we have a early edition of from beyond the first comic book i worked on and al columbia was part of that so there's really early al columbia stuff very limited editions of those strange pirate tales which is also an early steve manning book so this is all stuff from the asylum press vaults that is not always available and we're just pulling it out now and uh we just kind of want to offer it up as you know add-ons and rewards in case people hadn't gotten those and you know they're just very limited printings no, of that, those that's amazing and just the uh, just the history alone um is is incredible i mean you have great art beautiful covers i i just i love it I, I and i'm i'm intrigued by the story itself i i love the action sequences that you you've drawn and you're gonna get you're gonna get funded for sure i, I hope mean, so definitely. i hope so I, I would love to overfund because we're really trying to fund two issues and the funding i i knew it was going to be a struggle but we really could use like 10,000 10, would be, would really allow us to fund the printing and production of both. So there's Warlash. There's the cover, Andy Hall, Beautiful. UK illustrator, Steve Mannion, oh. Colors by Omar Estevez. I mean, look at that stuff. It's great, right? That's beautiful. Holy jeez. Like, and this is the Dwayne Harris story. I just I love the line work that everything is just amazing like 
And the colors are beautiful. Cool, right? Oh. <laughs> I mean, Dwayne Harris is great. Oh. I always loved his work. He's got a great, just style. great sense of, great style, great sense of story. I mean, it's just awesome. Yeah. So that is pretty much that book. I mean, there's some other pages too. And if you go to the if you go to the Kickstarter and you go to the updates, we're showing a lot of uh, of the updates. And I could show you if I if you go to updates, right? So uh, we're also cross promoting like other Kickstarters too. But let's go to this update. This is Rist Sekulowski with Omar Estevez on colors, mm -hmm. and this is a page to BioBurden. You can see that. Yeah, I see it. That's um, a page to BioBurden. Here's an uncolored page. Rist Sekulowski, and this guy's from uh, from Serbia. Like, I love the Serbian Serbian artists, man. I, I found a lot of guys from Eastern Europe that just they are, and they were cross promoting with other Kickstarters. This is Enmity. Mm -hmm. If you guys are out there, check those guys out too. Um, let's see. Uh, let's, oh, no more Rist Sekulowski stuff. Look at that. That's and this is all going to be in color, but um, I mean, just black and white alone is still great. Cool, totally. right? Yeah, <laughs> no, totally. Oh, we're at twenty three fifty two, so we got a couple more backers. Oh yeah, like, might as well promote this. This is Goon Cartoons. This is my YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube slash Goon Cartoons, this is my like original animation channel where I do parodies, I do live draws, I do. You know, I post old vintage like um, Betty Boop cartoons and public domain cartoons, but anime, anime is an original. The Devil is an original. Cosmic Candies like Total EDM Vlog is an original. Buck Billy is an original. Pissed Off Possum. We have a bunch of Cuphead um, tunes. We, we did a bunch of Nyan Cat parodies. So this is like 8 bit theater. Mm -hmm. So we just did our own little parodies of this. and. <laughs> This just goes for like three minutes. It's because Nyan Cat was like, I don't know, it was like 20 minutes or 50 yeah, minutes or something. It's crazy. So we did our own parody version of that. Just And it was for the, uh, what was it? The um, the the, re the 10 year anniversary of Nyan Cat just came up and stuff. So we kind of did that. But there, there's just a lot of stuff. There's original cartoons, there's time-lapse draws. I do live draws and stuff, so those things come up. So if you're into original animation, check out Goon Cartoons, subscribe. We update at least a few times a week. So um, That's it's definitely something to uh, check out. Good stuff, wow. You, you just have so much to offer as a creator. Like, we could talk for hours, literally. <laughs> I know, man. I mean, there's, I've done a lot through the years. I've been through the 90s, the indie boom. I worked at Heavy Metal, and Kevin Eastman let me, you know, edit a couple issues. I edited 271 and 277, which was really super fun. Like, I grew up reading Heavy Metal. Then I was a creator. And then when he was like, oh, why don't you just take over the editorial and do your own issue? I was just, like, floored, you know. And, and, and 271 was just great because I was able to every story was you know picked by me and i was able to pick creators and stories that were inspired by the 70s and 80s heavy metal and 90s because i had some you know people that were kind of trying to do the bisley stuff and just do my own thing and it was it was always a pretty favored issue among collectors like they really enjoyed 271 because it was all inclusive stories there was no serials in there like we paused the Bilal serial that was going on so that I could do my issue so they're all self-contained stories and it's stuff from Asylum Press as well as new stuff and people that I brought in that were just like hey do your own thing yeah, so it was just really fun and then when I did 277 that was the horror special that was also very fun and I got to do got to bring a bunch of horror people into that issue and then after um you know that Grant Morrison had his run and, uh, you know, I still continued to be an editor and deliver stories and shorts. And I got Pepe Moreno to come back and I introduced Pe uh, Peach Momoko to the scene. Nice. Um, got a bunch of her stories in there. 
you know, working in Hollywood is cool too because I worked on a bunch of animated stuff and I worked, you know, for Blumhouse. I worked on, you know, Truth or Dare, Fantasy Island, Insidious, The Last Key. And I just recently did some storyboarding on The Conjuring. The Devil Made Me Do It, the new Conjuring. Just some reshoots. I was there for some of the reshoots. So, um, you know, that was fun too. And you, you get to work with a lot of cool people and you get to work on a lot of cool you know, production. So I do like bouncing back and forth between Hollywood and comics. But the reason I love comics is because I get to do my thing. I get to do my stuff my way. Nobody's telling me what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm in control. You're the boss. And I just love it. I mean, that's what's great about comics is that you don't need a big budget. You don't need Hollywood. You don't need a crew. You don't need anything. All you need is you, a pencil, some paper, and time. And that's it. And you can you can you can you can write, draw, a letter, color. You can do everything, and put it up there, and it's done. And and that's why I love comics. It's just a pure kind of form of expression and storytelling. No one can tell you you can't do it. With, with a movie, it's easy for you to. I got a great screenplay. Well, you can't make it without a budget. You can't make it without an actor. You can't make it without a set or a permit or insurance or whatever. I don't have a camera. Well, now you could use your iPhone, but you know. With comics, you, there, there's really nothing stopping you. If you can afford paper and a pencil and a, and a pen, and you have time, you, you could you could do your comics. I mean, that's it. That's the, what I love about it. Out of all the the people I've interviewed, it's the the artists and the creators themselves that always inspire me. Because I, I started interviewing indie creators back in the in for web comics. So when when TGT right. started way back when. So when you get to interview a person like a Phil Folio from Girl Genius and he did Magic the Gathering cards and all this other stuff as your 10th right. episode, you know, the sky's the limit from there. So um, just seeing these people that have been in the industry that have stayed passionate for what they're doing, um, especially like, like hearing you talk about your, your days in heavy metal and what you're currently doing now, you're, you're still passionate about art and creating and you know, those that stay creative, I think, stay the youngest in, in terms of yeah, age. Right. <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, I, I, I definitely poop out earlier. I, I think I, I, I don't know. The, and like when I'm in my 20s, man, I could draw to like three in the morning and I just wouldn't be able to stop. And um, that that's just something when you're young and you have the energy. It's, it's great. You know, like when you look at when you look at those guys like early Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee when they're working for Marvel, I mean, you know, those guys were you know, staying up all night and just stuck to that drawing table and just working constantly and look, it paid off for them, you know? I mean, they, they really just have a great talent and, you know, they were able to start Image and start their own studios and, you know, it's just, it's just really amazing. But yeah, I mean, I think you can be passionate about comics and what you do and, and, and being indie. And now with Webtoon, like when Webtoon first came out, I was so old school. I was so stupid. I'm like, y you're going to give it away for free. That's so stupid. Like you, you, what are you doing giving it away? For? You have to sell your comic book. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm not seeing these people are like building this huge audience of, I'm like, I'm like, no one's going to read your comic for free and then buy it. But they, of course they do. They, people want to read it for free and then they'll support you on Kickstarter and they want, you know, a nice collected edition. Like I, I was, I was almost ignorant. Like I just didn't get it when you come from a background where it's like, no, you have to sell your comics. Why are you giving it away for free? I was just like, so, you know, like against it. And, and, and so like old school. And I look back, I'm like, Oh, I just, I, I should have like started sooner. And now of course I'm on webtoon and tapas and I'm all over that stuff. But you know, th those young kids, when they came out, they just gravitated to it. And they're like, yeah, webtoon, webtoon, you know, it's all about web comics, web comics. And, um, you know, a lot of them built a massive fan base, way, way bigger than anything I ever had, even when I was in print. They have hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of followers. It's crazy. Yeah. That 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 number is more than the highest selling Marvel and DC comic. <laughs> you know, That's a, that just like Spawn just sold, like got orders for 200,000, right? Mm -hmm. It's a major order for Spawn Universe, 200,000 copies, you know. I think an issue of Walking Dead did like 300,000 and people are blown away. Well, Webtoon creators get millions of views. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
it's crazy the, the the difference now i don't know if all those million will come and purchase a printed version of the webtoon probably not but it's still an amazing fan base you know yeah but even a even a purchase of a digital copy of a book is still a copy of a book that's true yeah right so sure it, it's a, it's the little little victories you can pull off <laughs> yeah right is there anything i haven't brought up that you'd like to share I mean, I guess just, uh, you know, asylumpress.com or um, you go to the website and we'll also be in Diamond Previews so you could pre-order us uh, through your comic shop. So definitely uh, do that if you can. Asylum Press has a lot of back issues. Um, We're on Twitter. Frank Forte Art is my Twitter. Um, Frank Forte Comics is my comic Twitter and Instagram Um, and Asylum Press. I'm, I'm on Facebook and and I'm on Twitch and I'm on YouTube all over the place. I mean, you can just go to my websites and my, my social feed and you can find all my other links and stuff. Everyone has one or two people that kind of inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I mean, I, I guess in comics, it would definitely be um, Bernie Wrightson. I always liked Bernie Wrightson's style of art um, when I was uh, younger um that stuff just gravitated to me and i would say i would have to be frank miller i mean i know a lot of people say that but when i was younger i was reading daredevil off the racks when he was drawing it and before that you know i liked a lot of the bronze age stuff and i read all that stuff from the 70s but when he started doing daredevil it was just something different about it and the the way he drew and the stories and that kind of storytelling was, um, you know, kind of, I, I don't know if you see that influence on me because I'm no Frank Miller for sure, you know, but just trying to push the limits and do something different where people say, oh, wow, this is cool, um, kind of has been instilled in me since I saw that stuff. I would say Bernie Wrights and Frank Miller, but I also like John Byrne, Chris Claremont, that X-Men run. I love Michael Golden as early influences on my work anyone from a a more personal level then yes there are some art teachers now larry poons is someone you might not know i mean he's kind of a known artist in the op art scene in new york city and i took some classes with him and he just had this drive where he kind of yelled at you (laughs) a little bit but he yelled at you in a way to make you work harder. So it was like this, if he if he yelled at you and, and like trashed you in, in your work, the other students would come up to you and go, oh, he likes you, he likes you. I'm like, you really? Cause he just trashed me and yelled at me. No, no, that's how he, that's how he shows that he likes you. And, and, and he was just like kind of a interesting guy that was just like for art, like paint, get up, do your work, just paint, just get it done, put pencil to paper, paint to canvas, and just just do it, even if it's not something you like, just paint every day, all, all day, you know? So he was just like, just do it, you know? From a professional perspective, you've you've worked at Heavy Metal, you've been an editor, you've, you're an artist, you've been doing this for a number of decades, and you're very talented in what you do, in fact to be in animation still after all these years is is a huge accomplishment and you're passionate about everything that you've done. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I don't, I I don't know why that is. I don't, I feel like, um, you know, other people have, you know, I've had this conversation with other people and they're like, no, you are successful. Look at all the stuff you've worked on and, and sure you could, you could, you could argue that I think my personal feeling of success will be when I'm able to, you know, make a living doing my own stuff, whether it's selling paintings or art or comics. When I'm working for hire through for other people, you know, it's definitely lucrative and it allows me to, you know, make a living and, and, and do what I do. So it's cool. Um, I personally find success as an artist being able to be self-sufficient with your art. And that's something I don't think I've reached yet. So that's the only reason technically that I would say I'm not 
successful, even though I've been a success in, you know, Hollywood and animation. I've worked on a ton of shows and I've been doing it since the late 90s. Um, being an independent creator or an independent artist and being self-sufficient, you know, it takes a while to get there. And I think working as a story artist, when you're working 40, sometimes 50 hours a week, this stuff, the comics, the art, this stuff goes by the wayside. It's harder to do this when you're working. So a lot of times you, you have to put this aside to, you know, do the other stuff. So I think it's good now to, to get back to it. Like, this is what I would really love to be doing, you know, drawing War Lash and having other people, you know, work with me, other creators and drawing comics. So look, I'm getting there. That's my own personal issues that I'm, I'm dealing with. I mean, I, I guess I'm successful in some aspects but I would say not as successful in others. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? Mm, it's a tough one, man. I don't know. You, you got to kind of be Teflon and like push that shit aside. But, you know, just like anyone, you have failures. Um, you know, I worked in the 90s at a, um, uh, we did special effects for haunted houses, mm -hmm. you know, around Halloween time. We had this company called Stage Fright. And um, while it was real fun and I learned a lot, it was very difficult to make money. I think only because haunted house owners are kind of sharks. And even though we had this really high quality product of haunted house props and everything, the people just didn't want to pay for it. They just wanted cheap stuff where we were building stuff. We're like, look, this stuff is going to last you season to season. It's not going to break down, but they didn't want to hear it. They didn't, they didn't get it. So that was one uh, failure that I had some other um things along the way man you just gotta like learn from your mistakes and keep going but look sometimes they bug you you know you're you, you waste a lot of time at it something you're passionate about and it doesn't work you know it uh it can hurt you know but you just gotta kind of plow through figure out what you did wrong read some books look at some people that are successful change course and reboot and just keep going the younger generation are looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own right, whether it's independent creators, artists, maybe in the film industry, maybe storyboard artists, who knows, but they are becoming creative. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Tell them to not do it, man. Go into finance, go into real estate, go into something where you're, where you're, where you're making money. No, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of way, a lot of ways for artists, and I've seen young artists be really successful, really quick. Where I'm amazed at, you know, these people in their teens and twenties using the internet and Twitter and YouTube and Webtoon or whatever to get popular. I mean, I, I don't know if I have the best advice because I'm nowhere near as successful as some of these young kids coming up and then doing it. You know, I would say, um, you know, follow your passion and and learn how to use the internet and social in combination with conventions and appearances and gallery showings if you're an artist or whatever, just to get your work out there, you know, and just be kind of your own best ambassador for your work and don't be afraid to be out there pitching. I mean, I get it if you're shy and you're like kind of a recluse, there are some people that are like that, but I think it's better to um, be out there pitching, selling your wares, selling your goods and just, um, you know, promoting yourself. I think if you, if you can do that and you can, you know, kind of keep it up, you'll be successful. Well, Frank, I do hate to say this though, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I, I do want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a true pleasure having you on. Yeah, man, Kurt, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We'll have to uh, do it again and go over some more stuff in case we uh, missed anything. We uh, could talk about um, good Bronze Age comics. We yeah. could talk about the uh, seduction of the innocent banning comics in the 50s we could talk about whether or not mr fantastic uh you know is doing all he can to save the world and we could talk about all sorts of stuff right i, I think he's shirking his duties but it is what it is so <laughs> but yes we could easily talk about that stuff the next time we have you on like i said that ends this particular episode of two weeks talking check out frank's work and of course his kickstarter which we'll have in the show notes as well 
uh, look at to everything that he's, that he's done and as well as his YouTube channel subscribe to everything that he has really beautiful work take a look at it Warlash is going to be a, a hit I know it for sure um, tune in next week for another great interview on Two Geeks Talking which I believe it's going to be Sam Johnson from Geek Girl and then we're going to have uh, Ryan Estrada creator of the Band Book Club which was just nominated for an Eisner uh, and the Tony Isabella creator of Black Lightning is going to be on so that's going to be like a back to back birthday special for me on Sunday cool. so good stuff thanks for everyone for listening and watching like I say every week everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out thanks guys thanks for having me appreciate it